And good morning, everybody, or good evening, wherever you're watching. Thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baghurst, and today's guest is soccer coach Omar Badran. Omar, thank you so much for taking the time to, to share a little bit about your experiences. If you wouldn't mind, just maybe give us a, an overview of how you started in soccer and where you are today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. Um, so I'm originally from Lebanon. I was born and raised there. I moved to the UK at the age of 17 uh, to pursue an undergrad science. I also had brief stints um, in Norway, Italy, Saudi Arabia. After that while, I decided to move to the United States and pursue a master's in sports management. And I'm currently going on to my US soccer A license and I'm doing an executive coaching curriculum. Um, so I started coaching seriously when I came to the United States, which was just about two and a half years ago. Big decision to, to make that. What was the rationale for coming to the U.S.? I'm curious. Well, uh, to be perfectly frank, my father uh, went to college in Duke uh, University. So he just ever since, you know, when I was growing up as a young kid, he just talks about the U.S. and how great the culture is. And he says that I'm a perfect fit there because I'm very competitive and sports in the United States is just all about competition. So my dad has been egging me on for about 15 years now. So I thought I'd, you know, shut him up and finally come over. <laughs> and and are you you currently coaching, correct? I'm sorry, say that again. Are you currently coaching? Correct, yes. Uh, so I'm currently the goalkeeper coach at UNC Charlotte. And I'm also the goalkeeper director for Charlotte Soccer Academy based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And until recently, I was coaching for the professional uh, soccer team in the NISA League uh, called Stumptown Athletic, also based in Charlotte. And I'm curious, those of us who've been in soccer uh, maybe joke about uh, goalkeepers being different or, or unique individuals willing to sacrifice their body to, to stop a ball from going in the goal. Uh, I'm curious about your experiences as a goalkeeper coach because most soccer coaches don't coach the goalkeepers. They coach the other 10 players. What are some of the, the experiences that you've had working with goalkeepers where – Maybe maybe you can share with others the, the unique nature of, of this position. Yeah, I think, you know, goalkeepers do have to be different because the demands of the game are so different. Um, so there's definitely a mental component there. And, you know, when I coach eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, my first recommendation to the parents is to put them in as goalkeepers because it builds a lot of empathy. So you know what your goalkeeper is going through emotionally mm -hmm. and it creates a sense of accountability and it's a high risk situation. So you build leadership qualities and you get a view of the whole field, right? Just from a tactical point of view, you see what's going on. You have the best view out of everybody on the field. Um, and I think one other aspect that I think influences how you coach goalkeepers versus how you coach outfield players is memory. Because as a striker, you can miss nine chances, but if you score the 10th one, people will remember the goal that you scored and they'll forget all of your misses. Whereas, as a goalkeeper, it's the exact opposite, right? You can make nine saves, and then if the 10th shot goes in, people tend to remember the goal that you, the shot that you conceded. Um, so the biggest, you know, struggle that I had when I started coaching versus being a player was emotional intelligence. It's how to create an environment where, you know, we're process oriented, we're not outcome oriented, we're focused on performance because there's so much that's out of our control, right? As goalkeepers, so we need to focus on the process and our performance and being brave and aggressive and just showing that overall attitude that leads us to the outcome that we desire. Were you, did, did you play goalkeeper growing up or did you play? I did. Okay. So one of the questions I, I, I kind of had is how, how do you transfer what you know from your experiences to those goalkeepers at the same time understanding that your experiences and your personality are not their experiences and their personality. So how do you coach them to make them better without almost enforcing your own views and, and experiences on them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, have you ever done the DISC personality test by any chance? So I've done the test three times and I'm, right, I'm very high on dominant. 
on, on every single time that I take the test, I get like a absurdly high on dominant. And the thing that, you know, goalkeeper coaches, I think it would be helpful to take into account is what personality type is your goalkeeper because each personality type has different motivations and different fears, right? So if I go to a dominant style goalkeeper and I'm all open and vulnerable, it just won't gel. And I tried that once and I failed miserably. I tried being open and vulnerable with another goalkeeper and who is a dominant style athlete as well. Didn't work. Whereas I tried that with the influencer and I won her trust over like that. So with the dominant one, her motivations are different. So with her, I needed to be empirically based. Hey, I've seen the evidence. I've seen you do it. You've killed it in this position, this position, this position. You are more than ready. Now go kill, right? So how you talk to different goalkeepers really depends on, like you said, their experiences, who they are, what their background is, what culture they come from. And you talked about goalkeepers requiring a short memory, which is very true. How do you help that goalkeeper who has had that horrible game? And we're not talking about, oh, I let one in, because that happens. Everybody knows it happens. But we've also seen goalkeepers or, you know, place kickers and other sports in, in situations where it is very obvious that somebody is falling apart. You see that in your goalkeeper, and then they have to come back a week later or a few days later and put on another performance after having just a miserable game. How do you help them forget that, knowing that it's very hard to forget what you just did a few days ago? Yeah, again, it's a great question, and I'm, I can take two hours to answer that. But two key areas that stand out for me is one mantra that I always use, and my goalkeepers are sick to death of me saying this, but the future is more important than the past, always. Mm -hmm. So whatever happened in the past, we have to use it because the future is more important. The next training session is more important. The next game is more important. That's it. That should be our focus. Um, and I think the second aspect of it is your goalkeepers have to know that you're going to back them no matter what. Because if they feel like they're going to get scolded when they make a mistake, you know, stress, I'm sure you know much better than me. And there's people that are extremely qualified to talk about this uh, much better than I am. But stress influences your performance in such a detrimental way. So if you play with the knowledge that your coach is going to back you no matter what, and, you know, I tell my goalkeepers I'm proud of them no matter what performance they put in, then that goalkeeper is just naturally going to give more and they're going to be braver and going to take more risks. And that's what I, what I want from my goalkeepers. I need them to take risks, but they can't do that without my backing, without knowing that I will support them from a mental point of view, you know, taking care of their mental health, making sure they're confident before we get into the tactical and the technical breakdowns, uh, if that makes sense. It, it does. Yeah, it, it's hugely important. Many, many years ago, I, I was a, a soccer coach and, and worked with goalkeepers at a, a university level. And we had the challenge of two goalkeepers who were very equally um, skilled. One was a little more experienced. The other one was maybe a little bit more athletic or, or maybe, maybe to get those, those balls that the other one couldn't. We had a hard time choosing which, which one played. And it created... I think it's fair to say it created tension in the team because they're both capable of playing. Have you ever had that situation? And, and how do you decide which goalkeeper plays and, and which one sits on the bench? That's, yeah, that's a great question. That's such a difficult dilemma. I've experienced that as a player and I've experienced it as a coach as well, where I have multiple goalkeepers who are just super talented, super hardworking, very aggressive but for me i created a uh what i'm trying to think of the word in english it's like a category of goalkeeping so you have the physical the technical the tactical the psychological but then there's the social mm. so what is your relationship with the, with your teammates right so if if i talk to the back four and each of them says well i can feel more confident with that goalkeeper and the answer is consistent then the social category is the one that makes a difference for me. And I, I encounter so many situations where I see goalkeepers on an, on an equal playing field. Psychologically, they are monsters. Technically, they're very good. And physically, they're some of the most professional athletes I've ever seen because they know that you know, they need to get into physical encounters in the game. But for me, the determining factor is the social side. 
because as a goalkeeper, you absolutely need to be a leader. You have to lead in your own way. Some people are very quiet leaders. Some people are very loud. I was very loud, but you, it really, it really uh, impacts uh, the outcome of the game. If your relationship with your teammates is poor, you know, if as a center back, they look behind them and they see a goalkeeper who's anxious or not giving enough information or someone they don't respect that much, it's definitely going to play into our decision making. Yeah. It's a really hard one. And I like, I like that perspective. A lot of coaches don't necessarily look at the social aspects. Uh, and we, we sometimes see players playing together who won't even speak to each other. And they perform, they still perform well because it's a sport and they're doing what they're supposed to do. Flip side, we see players who maybe don't even pass to each other because they're not on, they're not on good terms off the field. I want to switch. You've, you've been, you've been across many countries coaching and playing soccer and living. I'm curious what your perspective of soccer in the U S is maybe sports in the U S and also coaching in the U S where do you think, where do you, th what do you think we do? Well, where, where can we move forward in coaching as we, we train coaches? I mean, it's what we do. Yeah. I had a difficult time adapting to the coaching here for sure. Uh, because I found that the culture here, and not just talking about sports and soccer, but just talking in general, everything is short-term future, right? Everything is short-term. Um, how can we get instant results? But, I mean, you know better than me. If you want to focus on a project or diagnosing a culture or changing a culture, it's a long-term thing. It's a long-term. And sometimes it's difficult for people, especially in the U.S., to zoom out, to, you know, lean back and look at the whole situation and... Um, and actually look at, okay, where are we in the process rather than thinking, okay, what do we do two weeks from now or a month from now? Um, that's been the biggest thing for me because the players also think that way. So they go through, I have one player who went through two weeks of poor form, um, you know, just not, not, at, not at her best. Well, and I said to her, you know, when we first started out maybe 10 months ago, your trajectory has been 45 degrees. There's always going to be a zigzag, you know, there's always going to be a slight one step back, two steps forward all the time as you go up that graph. But you need to have context and you need to have perspective. You know, you need to be able to zoom out and say, actually, it's not that bad. Um, and I think Jose Mourinho said it in the press conference, you know, the truth is in the whole. And so you, the truth is in the entire process. It's You judge someone from the minute they go in until the minute they leave. It's not short term, short term. And I admit that's something that I have had difficulties to adapt to because everything is short term, you know, solutions. But yeah. Let me take that that example that you gave. I agree completely. We, we definitely tend to have that win now perspective rather than develop a, a consistent stream of winning down the road. At what point do you get that goalkeeper who's having that dip? And at what point do you, do you maybe pull them out to allow them to figure out what's going on? Maybe it's, maybe it is mental, maybe it is social, but, but not playing well. How do you, how do you judge? And I, you may not be that person. It may be the head coach, but I would, I would assume, or I would hope in conjunction with you determining, you know what a uh, player Player A over here just isn't performing and hasn't been performing for a little while. We need to put in B because we know B can also do a good job. Where do you draw that line? Knowing that when you pull A out, you're taking away some of their confidence too. Yeah, um, again, it's a great question. And, you know, for me, it has to do with culture, you know, the DNA of the organization. A common mistake I used to make when I first started out coaching is I tried to find technical solutions to, to challenges that are a little bit complex, that are rooted in people's values, their beliefs and their loyalties. I figured out, okay, the problem is deeper than that. It's not going to require a technical solution. I have to assess, you know, what the culture is and what it values. And, you know, I'm learning through my executive coaching, um, you know, curriculum, my certificate that, you know, there's three layers to culture. There's your artifacts, it's things that you can see and evaluate, like posters, what people wear, uh, doing a check-in before training or a mandatory checkout at the end of training. 
the second layer is your espoused values. It's what you say your aspirations are, what, what are your ideologies, what are your core values. But the absolute deepest layer of culture is your basic cultural assumptions. And that is your, your perceptions, your thoughts, and your feelings, which ultimately determines how you behave, right? So I, I needed a lot of time to get to that deepest layer, the perceptions, thoughts, and feelings of all the goalkeepers in order to transform their mentality, their mindset into a long-term thing. And one of our basic assumptions, you know, I hope that they'll agree with me, is that mistakes are a part of life and mistakes are absolutely necessary to learn and grow. And they're going to make a lot of mistakes because I'm going to force them into situations that are outside their comfort zone. But I got to tell you, Tim, every single one of them has reacted absolutely brilliantly because we are in an environment where the basic assumptions is that mistakes are a fantastic opportunity to learn and grow rather than, hey, you're going to get scolded if you make a technical error or if you, you know, you give the ball away or if you let a goal in. Really interesting. And uh, I really like the, the example of, of those three layers you gave. You said perceptions, thoughts, and feelings. If you don't have a good relationship or an honest relationship with your athlete, you are not going to get their perceptions, thoughts, and feelings. That requires a, a deep relationship with that athlete. How, what things do you do in order to, to reach that, to, to, get, to get that relationship? Because, and, and I'll be honest, I've interviewed many people on this show and a lot of times I ask for specifics and I get generalizations. And when I say, can you give me an example of how you do this? Well, particularly about getting to know your athletes or, or developing that relationship, why well, just talk to them? Okay, I, I, we all talk to our athletes, but what, what specifically do you do to really get to know them beyond just interacting with them on a daily basis, which is what we all do. Do you, do you have any ways that you, you try to get to know them a little better or maybe a little quicker than just over the course of the season, we learn to trust each other? Yeah, um, I do have certain techniques that I learned from uh, Dr. Wade Gilbert. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but- Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah he, you know, I plagiarize literally all of his, his work and all of his methods. Uh, you know, the first thing that I did, I remember when I first came into, you know, the college game is after a couple of months of getting to know them and doing really hard sessions, um, I would just write them letters. So I would, you know, write a letter with like five points that I really like about them. And it's really to do with their innate talent, something that they're born with. It, I'm always praising behaviors. I'm like, hey, even though you didn't make that save in the top corner, I love the fact that you tried or I love that brave moment. I love that you went to four of your teammates who are struggling and you praise them, you put your arm around them. That's leadership qualities. I know I can count on you. So it's just like writing letters, putting them in an envelope, making it personalized, writing their names on it, being like, hey, make sure you open that privately, not in front of anybody. Um, so that's one technique that I did. And I think that built a lot of trust with them. And I think, you know, one other thing, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but I praise effort over skill. So as long as they're doing their best, they know that I'm never going to turn on them. Um, there's, you know, plenty of different techniques. One technique that I was surprised that it actually worked out so well, I had the goalkeepers write letters to their outfielders. And that improved the relationship between the goalkeepers and the outfielders. And then the outfielders appreciated that so much. They were like, wow, like that meant so much to me. I've never received a letter like that. The goalkeepers were so thoughtful. They were so proactive. So these are just like a couple of techniques that I use in order to build team cohesion and challenge those basic assumptions that I mentioned earlier, which is the deepest layer of, of a culture. And honestly, there's no shortcut. It takes a long time to change. But as long as the players feel like you're invested in their mental health and their physical well-being and their mental well-being, you know, you, 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 they're going to kill for you, right? Yeah. They're going to they're gonna go out there and they're going to be brave. Yeah. Um, some other techniques that I'm that I'm trying to think of off the top of my head, you know, again, I was taught by um, Esme Gullick, who's a mental performance coach at UNC Charlotte, is be careful what you're praising. So this is why, this is why now I'm so careful, not just to praise a good technical execution. I'm also praising, you know, signs of good body language, good effort, 
you know, when they reach out to teammates and they try to be leaders, these, those are the things that mean a lot to me. And I, I always tell the goalkeeper, I over communicate it. I'm like, hey, this is what matters to me, not just as a coach, but as a person. You know, I was always taught to work hard. I was always taught to, um, to always stand up for my teammates. And I guess the final thing that I'll say about this is vulnerability. So I'll tell the goalkeepers, hey, if you feel insecure or you feel like you haven't, done, you haven't been good enough or you feel like you're not good enough, I've been there, right? I've been through severe anxiety, you know, borderline depression when I was a player. I've had self-esteem issues. I've been, had sleeping disorders. I've been very open about my past with the goalkeepers and that kind of built the trust between me and the goalkeepers even more. Because once you share your vulnerabilities and you show them that you also make mistakes and you also have flaws, that trust is just going to be stronger. And it also, as you alluded to earlier, depends on the personality of the, the goalkeeper, because you may have that goalkeeper where you're vulnerable and they see you as weak because they're the complete opposite to sharing and caring. And, but, but I take your point that having that honest relationship with your athletes certainly opens the channels for, if I'm willing to share with you, I hope you're willing to share with me as well. Um, I, I do want to say, you, you mentioned it, so I'm going to give him a little shout out. Wade Gilbert, Gilbert here, he, he wrote a, a big book called Coaching Better for Every Season. It is a big book, I do warn you. Uh, it's a very good book uh, as well, by the way. So if, if you have a chance to read it, if you're into coaching, I, I do encourage you to read it. It's, it's a really good one. Um, you could read mine too, but we won't go there. <laughs> um um omar if you if you kind of think about coaching as a whole and and look at your experiences uh, working across a variety of different different groups different international athletes and, and now here in the u.s coaches who who are watching this have have a unique op opportunity to get better and learn from you and I'm curious what advice you would give them based on your experiences, uh, both in the U.S. And, and abroad. I think, wow. First of all, be invested in your players. You know, that's, you know, before you talk about technical, tactical, physical requirements, or just show them that you're emotionally invested in their future and that you're willing to go the extra mile. You're willing to, to be, you know, uh, part of their journey. You know, essentially, and this is what I tell my goalkeepers is I'm going to coach hundreds of players, but you only have one career, only mm -hmm. one as a player. So you need to make the most out of it. And you that's part of your job as a coach to make sure that player reaches their full potential because they only have one career. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I did that I think your, your listeners um, might find interesting is have you heard of the Arizona State University observation instrument? No any chance. So it's um, it's an instrument used in order to measure coaches' behaviors during trainings or during games, and it basically categorizes fifteen behaviors. So you have praise, scold, positive modeling, negative modeling, use of first name, body language, humor, etc. So you have fifteen behaviors, and what I did, I recorded myself coaching. And then I compared my results with what elite coaches look like. Mm. And I think with elite coaches, the top three behaviors, if I remember correctly, are praise, pre-instruction, and, uh, oh God, I'm blanking on, on the third. I think it's silence. You know, the biggest discrepancy between rookie coaches and elite level coaches or more experienced coaches is silence. Um, I think Dr. Wade Gilbert, in that book that you put up, there's a quote that says, you know, 50, I think it's 50% difference between experienced coaches and rookie coaches when it comes to silence alone. They're just much more quiet. They're much more observant. They study the environment. They think before they speak. Um, so that's definitely a big recommendation of mine because my first time when I did that, my results were definitely not consistent <laughs> with what experienced coaches look like but I had enough practice of it. And then eventually I was able to at least shift my behavior towards a more productive um, uh, pattern of behavior. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, and one that I'm going to, to check out myself because I, we, we're always looking for ways to evaluate our coaches on our own programs and have them self-reflect. I don't think enough coaches 
I don't think enough coaches evaluate themselves or ask others to evaluate them who are non-judgmental. And what I mean by that is you as a goalkeeping coach will be evaluated by your head coach or the athletic director, uh, certainly other people who have a vested interest in how you do as a goalkeeping coach. I have no vested interest in how you do as a goalkeeping coach. If I came in to observe you, I can give you that independent review rather than a view that is skewed by whether I want you to stay, whether I want you to leave, whether I can afford to keep you, uh, all these variables that come into play. Maybe, maybe we, we don't want to, we don't want to get rid of you because we know certain things about you and it influences how we evaluate you. So coaches who get independently evaluated, I think have a, a real deeper understanding than an evaluation that is based on somebody who is connected to them in some way. Yeah. I tell my, my goalkeepers at the end of every season, whether it's the fall season or spring season that, when they leave at the end of the season and then we come back two months later, if I'm the same coach that I was two months ago when you last saw me, I deserve to be fired. My, my biggest fear as a coach is to stagnate because there's no such thing as stagnation. You either move forward or you move backwards as a coach. So I'm very much about forward momentum. And even if it means receiving harsh truths, mm -hmm. which I have received a lot <laughs> from coaches who evaluate me and with that Arizona State University observation instrument, I'm like, wow, that was a wake up call. I really need to adjust my behavior. Um, so you, you, it, it takes a lot of humility to do that. I'm not gonna lie, but you know, humility is what you need if you want to reach a really high level in, in coaching because no matter how good you are or how good you think you are, you can always improve. And I tell my, my goalkeepers, all of you are at an elite level, but even at that level, you can still get better. And it's my job to take you out of your comfort zone and push you even higher. If somebody wants to connect with you or maybe has some questions for you that they, they weren't able to ask today, what's the best way for them to reach you? Probably my email, um, which is badran. Uh, my last name, B-A-D-R-A-N-O, as in Omar99 at gmail.com. Or they can reach me through uh, LinkedIn. Okay. And, and LinkedIn, by the way, just look for uh, Omar's full name, Omar Badran. You should be able to, to find him there. He's very active on LinkedIn. I think that's actually how we, we connected with each other. Omar, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And, and of course, thank you all for watching, whether it's now in live or in the future. Of course, don't forget to subscribe, like, whatever, to make sure that you get notifications of these broadcasts. We've got another one coming up in a couple of weeks. Hope you join us. But until then, thanks so much for watching.